I was uh, very touched by little Soam, uh, little Om wanting to come up to sing for us, everyone who was there at the beginning, and how nervous he was. He was absolutely sure he was going to do it until he was alone in front of the microphone. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he called for his mom. And as soon as his mom came and sat next to him, he suddenly had all this courage, you know, and was able to sing actually quite nicely for a child of his age with a very melodic voice and a clear sense that he could hear what music was really supposed to sound like. That he couldn't do it by himself, but he could do it if his mother was there. You know, in our day and age where so much stuff gets posted on the internet and then finds its way into your email inbox, um, I, somebody sent me, because of my um, affection for dance, somebody sent me some child's dance rehearsal and, uh, you know, they start children really young and then put them in costumes and put them on stage. So this little girl, she's about two, and she's the smallest one in the line. And when, you know, rehearsal is one thing, but it's quite another to just come out on the stage. So all she could do was just begin to scream. And then her father, who was, a, as it happened, was a great big man, rushes up on stage. Some of you may have seen this. And he takes her hand, and then they do the whole thing together. He's also holding another baby. I don't know who this man is. He's holding a baby, holding his, her hand like that, and you know, doing all the little things that are needed, the little pirouettes, everything. But as soon as she was holding on to him, then everything was okay. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that just how it is with us? You know, we're really brave until we're not brave. I, I remember, um, I have intermittent vertigo. It's unpredictable. Every once in a while I'm a mountain goat. And it, most of the rest of the time, I'm not. <laughs> just to put it mildly. And when I was in Florence many years ago, uh, we were going to, uh, there's a, uh, the Duomo there, this big striped, huge building, and you can take this internal staircase. I also get a little claustrophobic. So there was this internal staircase up to a, and you do a catwalk around the inside of this very high building, very narrow catwalk, and then you can go out and be on the outside roof. Well, I just jumped into the crowd and I started up and first I'm having claustrophobia climbing up like this then we get out on the catwalk and I think this was actually a past life memory because I looked over the edge and I saw a lot of smashed bodies that had fallen off of this catwalk I don't know what it was from but I absolutely panicked just zipped back in the door ran backwards down that stair and just didn't come back to myself until I was out in the plaza where I just tried to breathe and calm down until everybody else came down. I wasn't proud of my performance. <laughs> and so a few years later, I had the opportunity to go back. And uh, oh, this woman, uh, Santoshi, was there. And Santoshi has a lot of physical courage. She's, very, she's a very tough, strong lady. I just decided I, I, couldn't, I couldn't let that stand. So as I remember, she was wearing a skirt, sort of this light-colored skirt. And I held on to the bottom of her skirt and watched her feet. I never looked up. I, I watched her feet. I went all the way up the stairs. I went all the way around the catwalk. I went all the way out to the top. And as long as I was holding on to her skirt and watching her feet, I was fine. There's some photograph on, of me on the top of that thing, and I just look. I'm so happy. I'm, I am clutching the wall, but nonetheless, I made it to the top. But it was because she wasn't afraid. And, you know, she's a sensible person, and she wasn't afraid. So what was I afraid of? You know, she was, she's just like me, except she wasn't afraid. And I, I often, thinking of all of these incidents, thinking vividly of that, um, what a difference it makes if we can be close to anyone who is different than us in the ways that we're trying to become. Isn't that so? And this whole um, experience of life is really all of us progressively, well really it's all about overcoming fear. Whether we have actual fear that causes us to turn around and streak down from a high place that frightens us, or whether it's the quiet fear of public speaking, or um, singing off key, or being alone in our old age, 
or facing illnesses or financial ruin, whatever it might be. In the Bible, St. Paul says, perfect love casts out all fear. I actually heard that phrase first from Vivekananda, and it was many years before I knew it came out of the New Testament. But I contemplated that very deeply, because from early on in my life, I've always been, I'll use the euphemism, high strung, you know, but prone to nervous imagination in many different ways. So fear was always an issue. And when I was, about the time I was 17 or 18, I began to realize that of all the emotions, it was the, the most useless. And yet, so intense when it overcomes us. And most of us don't live fearful all the time. People who are fearful all the time are somewhat mentally imbalanced. But a great deal of our lives in countless ways, is always just some effort to calm that nervousness. You know, I, I think now, growing up as a child, one doesn't see one's parents really until you're an adult. But I, I realize in retrospect that my father was a bit of an anxious person. He was a very good man, but he was also a little nervous. And I think about all the different ways that I can see now that he coped with that so that he could live a very successful and a very normal and a very well-balanced life. I watch in my own life how many of my personality characteristics have all been created just to make myself feel safe in this world. Isn't that so? But the difficulty is whenever we're just taking these moving parts and just rearranging them, I, I heard... Uh, I don't even remember the context. Somebody was talking about something Swami had said. And he said, oh, I know what it was. He said, you know, most people in life just take the same deck of cards and just keep moving them around. He said, but no matter how much you shuffle them, there's only four aces. <laughs> you just can't make their, there just can't be any more. Even if you get those four and you hold them in your hand all the time, there's still going to be all these other cards that are going to happen all the while. And so most of life in this world is just teaching us how to range those cards in a way that we will feel safe, that we'll know what's coming. But the difficulty is there's a, a force that's much greater that is really in charge of our lives. And no matter how hard we try, the unexpected just continually breaks through, doesn't it? You know, nowadays at, at our table we were talking, as people often do these days, about the, the state of our nation and the state of our democracy and the state of our laws and our just all those things, which is all very interesting because we live in interesting times. Um, but also, there's so many... Oh, we were talking about Israel because we're on our way there in January. We were just, I was just talking about evil people. People try to get power over others to make themselves feel safe. And people don't care about other people. There's just all these forces that we can't control. But eventually, all that pressure on us causes us to break through to a whole other level. And something, just, just some crack in this seemingly seamless curtain of reality, and we perceive that there, there is safety there's real safety, but it's on the other side. It's on the other side of what our schools teach our children and what our colleges teach our young people and what our government tells us is true. It's like all of that is just taking the same deck of cards and just moving it around and promising us that this time it's going to stay in order. But then that whole curtain parts and we realize there's, there's a world of, of, of true love on the other side of all that anxiety. Nowadays we have the wonderful experience of all these people who cross over to the other side of reality and, and then come back and talk to us about it. And they all tell us, or most of them, some of them actually go to hell. When Swami, when Swami, somebody at East West gave Swamiji a couple of books about people who died and went to hell instead of going to heaven, Swami said, I thought some of them must go to hell. <laughs> it's hard for me to understand how all of them could go to heaven because some of them were not good people. But even the people who go to hell come back 
with an understanding that it is not what it seems and that there, there is security and safety in this world, but we have to look for it in another place. So when I saw little Om up here, just unable to cope until his mother came, and I thought of the little dancing recital girl, unable to cope until this great big father comes. I mean, a, a little child would feel really safe in the presence of such a person. You know, it's just like, what do I have to be afraid of now? I watched even this morning, I was, or yesterday, I was driving down the road, and there was this man with a, a pretty big dog. And the dog must have been a puppy. I'm not that tuned into animals. Because I turned around and the dog had planted himself between his owner's legs and sort of stuck his head between his legs. So all you could see was the back of the dog. And the dog was just hiding, just like that. You know, and the owner of the dog was just comforting him, just like that. I can relate. I can relate. And in fact, that's exactly how Divine Mother wants us to feel. You know, when Om called his mother to come up and save him, she came eagerly. There was no part of her that didn't want to come. When that father saw his little daughter crying on the stage, a no power on earth could have kept him from rushing up to help her. You know, and there was no thought, oh, you should be able to do it yourself. It was, no, this is why I'm here. I'm here to help you. And you're right. All by yourself, this is a very scary world. But with perfect love, perfect love given, perfect love received, then all fear is cast out by that. I had a very deep experience in seclusion once. I was meditating, and you know, we often uh, talk in our meditation about offering ourselves, you know, offering love, offering ourselves. Um, if for our Thanksgiving service, we all came and put all these little pieces of paper which had mes have messages from us onto the altar, offering ourselves. So I was meditating and I had that thought. And then I, I just thought for a second, even all this offering is to a certain extent keeping myself busy. You know, and meditation itself is supposed to be a complete cessation of this necessity to assert our individuality which we're just so busy doing all the time. I often think the ego is like the walls of a submarine, you know, deep in the bottom of the ocean. And we've all seen the submarine movies when the pinprick comes through and then the ocean just desperately tries to get in, which is usually a pretty terrifying film at that point. But in fact, we assert our individuality all the time. And Divine Mother's constantly trying us to get us just to relax a little so she can flood us. So I was in my meditation and I thought, oh, instead of offering it out, maybe I should receive. To all who received him, gave he the power to become the sons of God, seemed like an experiment worth having. It was fascinating to me to see what happened when I tried to completely relax my heart and hold no uh, self-protected individuality. I simply couldn't do it. I was completely alone in seclusion. I mean, there was nothing, nobody. It was just me and my consciousness. But the, the self-protected individuality was so deep that even when there was nothing there but me, I still had this profound obligation to keep it up. Oh my, I thought, we have a long ways to go, don't we? Before we can offer this true little self. It was, it was much more instructive to me than all efforts to offer myself because then I could stay busy. But when I was trying to receive, all that was left was the barriers I've erected between myself and the acceptance of the divine reality as it really is. Now, that's not a sad commentary. That's just a commentary and, oh my, we haven't reached the end of the story yet which to me is really, really good news. If somebody were to tell me that I've achieved everything there is to achieve, that would make me really upset. You know, that would be really awful. If this were the apex of what spiritual life has to offer, it's a lot better than it was 50 years ago when I met Swami, which is almost to the day right now. But my, we have so much more in front of us. 
And all of that, whatever it is that we still cling to, you don't have to name it as fear, but it has to be called fear. Because otherwise, why wouldn't we put it down? You know, what is it? What is it that's so precious to us that we're keeping it? Now, this is our um, profound opportunity. Every single day is a profound opportunity because Divine Mother is just the same with us. And every time we find ourselves, whether we're four years old standing in front of a microphone or 45 years old sitting in a cubicle in an office in Silicon Valley or a mother taking care of a child or an older person facing the decline of the body, I have two uh, guests, long-term guests in my house, Keshava and Suryani, both of whom are very strong young people. They actually met, they were, both, they were both doing stunts on a movie set. That's how they met each other. I can't get into my walnuts anymore because they keep sealing the jars. <laughs> I just figured this out. They're out, of the, they're out of the way right now. I have to tell them, please, like, tighten it and then loosen it a quarter for me. You know, there I am. They've gone away and I can't open the walnuts. I, I stoop down to get something out of the lower cabinets and I uh, have to hold on to both sides of the counter to get up. I can still get up, but I, I don't spring up like I used to. We were doing a play here once. It was the singer in the nightingale. We had all these people playing birds and we had them all crouch down to be birds on the wire and then we were going to have them stand up. <laughs> it was like, you know, it was the singer in the nightingale performed by people over 90. <laughs> I mean, all these poor little birds, you know, are on their elbows and on their knees and they're helping. I mean, the, I went into hysterics. It was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> but that's what happens. It's not a joke when it happens. It's not a joke when that system we've been using to keep ourselves safe begins to go away from us. And so it's very, very wise to start now, whatever now is. That's why we're so happy with the children in our school, because we're starting them young. Where does happiness come from? Where does security come from? What do we do when we're afraid? Do we take it out on others? Or can we call on Divine Mother? Master came to bring us the news about Divine Mother, and, and nothing is more important Nothing is more important than just to know we appear to be alone in this world, but we are not. We are never alone. And all that everythingness that we're always using to keep ourselves safe, none of it is necessary and none of it will actually work because sooner or later it will all be stripped away. I came onto the path because of the realization that someday I would die so I thought of this when I was 18. Someday I would die, and when I died, I would only have my consciousness. And no matter how I tried to think, I, no matter how I tried to find the flaw in that thought, I couldn't find it. I thought, oh my, better get to work now. That's what happens when people go to the other side and come back. Oh, they say, it's not anything you seem. It's all about love, how much have you loved? How much have you let God guide you? How much do you know of Divine Mother's presence in your life? This is our thanksgiving. Our thanksgiving is a very simple one. We are children of God, and we have begun to realize that. Everything else is superficial. But that, you see, makes up for it all. It's a project. It's not easy. But at the end of it, we'll have something, not just for now, but for eternity. Now isn't that a gift worth striving for? Isn't that a gift worth opening our hearts and receiving? So God bless you all. And thank you so much for sharing in this wonderful spiritual family. I'm thanking my own self and thanking Divine Mother through all of you, but aren't we lucky just to be in this room and to have each other. God bless you. <laughs>